Welcome to the Animation 2025 uh, presentation. <laughs> My name is Sibyl and with me are Nathan and Kristoff and... <laughs> so a year ago we started a project, Animation 2025, and basically two goals. Speed up animators and make animation joyful. <laughs> Somehow, like, the first was added by a producer and the second was added by an animator. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so last year we had a big workshop at Blender HQ and we had a presentation here. We worked on the big picture. Like, where do we ideally want animation in Blender to go? What kind of big things can we think of? And of course, that went in all kinds of different ways. So we also worked on like core principles that would help us guide, like basically chasing our dream in a consistent way. So we came up, this is a screenshot of last year, right here. Uh, you can recognize the beam. Uh, so these core principles we set out, I will very quickly go over them. It has to be fast because otherwise your animators are slow and annoyed. It has to be intuitive, otherwise you don't know what you're doing. Um, like the tools have to be focused. You don't have to, shouldn't run all over the user interface to find what you need. You should just have the tools that you need in the place that you want them. It has to be iterative. So you have to be able to revisit your work and like make changes later because directors always want something else. It has to be direct. So you need to be able to manipulate what you see. Um, and in like last principle is the Suzanne principle. Whatever we think of, it has to fit within the bigger picture of Blender. We have to be like a good Blender citizen and not reinvent like a different kind of wheel unless we give that different kind of wheel to the rest of Blender as well and then the whole thing is consistent again. So this gave us like a great sense of direction and I really noticed that and, and other people as well, I'm sure, in the past year that like we could just talk and understand each other and get in sync very quickly. Um, so also the team has grown. Last year it was me on payroll working on animation. And people in the community, of course, helping out because that's what happens. Christoph, since uh, November last year, first joined two and then three days a week from Madrid on a development grant. And <laughs> And since April of this year, Nathan is also working four days a week for the animation module. <laughs> and he even moved from West Coast, US, all the way to Amsterdam, because he loves us so much. <laughs> it was for the stroke waffles. <laughs> and also, I want to mention Brad Clark and Jason Slifer, because they have been like, tremendous in, in like, a consulting role and have been very involved in the past year and before that as well. And Nate Ripsis, who is a community developer who has done fantastic work on the NLA and a whole bunch of other animation areas. So the team is quite nice now. So let's take a look at the shinies, the stuff that is now already in Blender that we've worked on for the past year. Graph editor performance. 4.0, 3.6. That was crystal. It's like uh, 12 times faster. Um, then you probably recognize these guys. And everybody loves them so much. Like protected layers doesn't do anything anymore since we have library overrides and no more proxy system, but they, they, they were there. And of course, everybody knows what's in the, like the second thing, second row. Um, so you get these add-ons. Uh, for example, uh, the bone manager. Many people use this add-on to just give these layers a name. Uh, but still, you're limited to th the 32 layers that Blender gives you. It doesn't support library overrides. It's, it wasn't that good. Uh, like the, the add-on is brilliant, but Blender isn't that good. So what we have now is bone collections. Woo! 
we kind of wanted to have like the Suzanne principle, like consistency and scene collections are called scene collections because they're owned by the scene and they con con contain scene stuff. So we wanted to call them armature collections and we discussed it and everybody said, yes, armature collections is like the good way to, to call it because it's consistent. And then everybody called them bone, bone collections. <laughs> so that's what they are. Um, as you can see, the layers are just ported over. So if you load a 3.6 file in 4.0, it's just ported over to the new system. All the bone assignments are still there. All the visibility settings are still there. Um, if you use that, that add-on, like that one, if you used that before, it will also port those names over. And then it's just layer one dash the name that you gave it. Also, that, so that is on the armature properties panel. On the bone properties, you can also see which collections they are a part of because that list can get quite long, but if you just select a bone, you can see what it is a member of. One thing that may be peculiar once you, when you first see it is that the, all the bone groups that were converted, because it's just grouping bones in a named thing, so that is a bone collection. So we also converted bone collections, uh, bone groups to bone collections. They're all hidden, because previously bone groups did not influence bone visibility, and now it's all one thing, so now they do. So mm. Another thing that we had to do, because the bone groups were moved to collections, and collections live on the armature, and the bone groups live on the pose, uh, I won't go into technical details much, but they live in different places in Blender, and that meant that you could not have bone colors in armature edit mode, for example, because that is operating on different data. But now we moved bone colors to the bone itself, so every bone can have its own color, and you have that in edit mode as well. You can even set them in pose mode a different color if you really want. Um, also, we changed how the bone colors are drawn in the, the dope sheet and graph editor, etc., cetera, uh, because it used to look like this on the left, like completely unreadable. So we just moved it to the side. I think over the past years, there were like three, four different design tasks that all said, just, just do this. Uh, so that's there now. Also, the operators that are about bone collections and, and like bone groves have been moved to collections. So you can select by the same collection. You can select bones by the same color. Um, and you can also assign or unassign to collections. Now, this again might at some point start to be a bit weird for you because you don't see them all. And that is the collections live on the armature. If you link in the armature from the a rig file, it's not editable. So you cannot assign or unassign any of the bone collections there. But we also added library override support. So in your shot file, you can add new bone collections and assign bones to it. So you can, on a shot by shot basis, set up that for, uh, for that particular need as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Christoph. Yes, so uh, I'm clearly not Dutch. <laughs> so we also have a lot of new edit uh, operators in the graph editor. Um, those are thanks to Ares Devo. He is actually the developer of Animate and gracefully decided that his uh, functionality should be in the Blender core. So he contributed a lot of patches, which he didn't have time to finish. So we just finished them for him. So yay community. <laughs> Um, there have been improvements to the pose library, uh, most notably from 4.0 on, uh, 4, 4 onwards, it now lives in the new region, which is the asset shelf. It's on the bottom, and this asset shelf was implemented by Julian Eisel, and it has a lot of new like features to sort your things. So you can have tabs on the top for each, um, like, like what are they called? Uh, Catalog. Catalogs, yeah, that's the word. Um, and you can search easily. Um, there are some additional features which have been implemented, which is you can flip the pose while blending it, and you can also subtract, subtract poses now, which I think is useful. <clears throat> One feature that has been requested for a very, very long time is uh, multi-editing of F-curve modifiers, which now is finally in there. Um, for this to work, the F-curve modifier has to have the same name. It's just like object modifiers, um, which also means you can name them now. 
Um, there are more smoothing operators in the graph editor as well. Um, what you can see here is the uh, Butterworths <laughs> filter. Um, so the other operator is the Gaussian smoothing oper operator, and the difference between them is that the Gaussian smoothing is a bit more predictable, so like artist-friendly-ish. Um, but it has the issue of volume loss, so if you um, smooth curves, the, the peaks tend to shrink, so like the Butterworth filter tends to avoid this. However, if you have like big sudden jumps, you might get these uh, fluctuations. Like if you, if you're like mocap editing, you usually don't care because you smooth over it. Um, and the Butterworth also has the nice feature of blending the edges. Is what you see here at the end. Um, the edges of your selection just try to keep the the slope. Some other time, some other minor improvements. Um, you can finally choose where the line, the relationship line, gets drawn from. So when you have multiple bones that originate on the same point, you can now see where they, like the relationships, go to. And your NLA strips finally no longer get stuck in the maze. <laughs> Big shout out to Nate Ripses. Perfect work. Um, the snapping options have been uh, like moved to the scene, which basically means they look now as they do in the free, free viewport. Um, and they are all synchronized between the animation editors. So like, if you change the setting in the dope sheet, it will be changed in the graph editor as well. And that also means we can Im implement new snapping functionality as soon as hopefully. <laughs> Um, there is a new uh, transform space, which is the parent space transform. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Our biggest fan. <laughs> uh, it basically means your uh, translation axes are aligned to its parent, which is very useful. And of course, a lot of tiny improvements. Um, better animation baking, the paint mode selection tools have been worked on. Um, the copy global transform add-on got a new feature. You can, uh, there's a new operator to quickly select different parts of keyframes, like the handles. Um, the bendy bones have got a new deformation like setting, and of course, bug fixes galore. And this was the section where we talk about what, you, what, what we have done so far. Now there is a section what we're gonna do in the near future. And that's mine again. So, in the near future, and this means like Blender 4.1-ish, at least we're now in a branch, um, is layered animation. We had a workshop last June, uh, again at Blender HQ, and the goal was like speed of animators by reducing manual data management, like the whole laborious task of switching out actions, linking actions maybe to another scene, uh, if you want to try out different things, like it's all, fuzz. So a bunch of desires that we set out, like we want to gradually build up animations. We want to start somewhere like blocking and then finesse it a bit more and then maybe a bit more and gradually build that up in a way that you maybe can also go back. Um, you want to try different alternatives. Maybe you want to offer your director like two or three different takes on the same bit of animation. Uh, you may have to adjust somebody else's animation and that might be yours from a week ago and you have no clue what you were doing. You kind of want to put like corrections on top of that. And then a bit more out there is like procedural animation, streaming in animation from other sources, could be an Alembic or USD file, could be a real-time motion capture system. Uh, and you want to animate on top of that again. Um, so all of these things we wanted to do and we figured, well, that is all layered animation. And on top of that, we have more desires. We want to keep animation of related things together. So instead of having these actions all over the place, we want to, like when you're animating like a baby, you're holding a baby and you want to animate that, the parent and the baby are basically moving as one thing, but they're two objects, so they get different actions. We want to fix that. And we want to make all animation linkable. And this is also like a stab at the NLA because every object has its own NLA. So if you want to do nonlinear editing, 
is not just every object having its own action, but also every object has its own NLA, which has its own strips with their own timing. And it's like super complex to keep that all in sync. So basically, this is what we have now. You have a character, say Einar, and you have some tracks on the NLA, and every track has at least one action. And you have to name them and manage them, or you forget to name them, and then something goes wrong and you're lost. And what we actually want to have is something like this. One character, one animation with different layers. And this animation should be like a data block, just like the action is now. Animation is going to be its own kind of data block. But the issue is that Einar is never really Einar. It's never one thing that you animate. You have the armature object, you have the armature data, you have the mesh object, maybe you want to animate a material or two, and then there's other things going on, and they all need their own action. So this is often resolved by driving everything from the rig uh, with drivers and bones and, and complicating your setup even more and slowing things down even more. But what we really want is that all these data blocks can point to the same animation data block. Currently, if you were to do this with actions, everything gets the same animation. And so this is something also we want to introduce that you get this decoupling, but still they're using the same block of animation. So with two characters out of the NLA, it gets even wilder with the number of actions that you need to juggle. And as I said, we just want to point those two at the same data block. So let's take a look at what that would look like. We have layers. Layers have keys, nothing really fancy. You have one for blocking, for finessing, keys don't have to match on the time like you would expect. Um, then we want to be able to like layer things on top of each other and determine how they mix together. Maybe you want to add a rotation instead of replacing a rotation, but maybe like, yeah, you gotta have that choice with an influence slider in there so you can fade it in, fade it out, animate that influence slider which is always fun because you're animating the animation system, which has its own technical hurdles. Uh, but this, like, this should be possible with the new system. Then we want to have children. Like we want to have hierarchies of layers where you can build up the layer of, say, one character in different layers, and then you have one parent layer that is just the animation of that character. You collapse it, you don't think about it anymore. This is one mode where the parent mixes in all the children and that acts as like the output of that parent layer. But also we feel that for things like um, takes where you want to have that one or that one or that one, but never at the same time, you should be able to tell the parent like, just choose your favorite child and ignore the rest. <laughs> and then you can try things out. Like uh, first the kid drools and, and, and then pukes, or maybe it drinks first and then starts drooling like these different takes. Also, takes like this and is very important in layout stage. Just, not just for character animation, but also for, for animating layouts. You want to try out different things as early as possible in your production. So during layout, being able to switch between these choices is, is super powerful. And then inside of that layer, it gets a little bit more complex. So we have different outputs. And we have, in this case, the output for Einar and the output for Teo. And that is how Einar and Teo know which, kind of, which part of the animation to look at. And this is why they can all point to that same animation data block and still know what to look for and what to ignore. They don't have to match. You don't have to have every output in every layer. It's just if the animation is there, you can just use it. Within one of those blocks, it is pretty much like an action is now. So at this moment, we're not redefining what an F-curve is. That is the, probably going to happen later at some point, but for this, not yet. Um, so these are basically what you're looking at is effectively three actions on, an, on a sort of a layering system. And so I said layers have keys. It's a bit of a lie. Layers have strips, and those strips have keys. And by default, a layer has one strip and it's infinitely long and you don't see it and you don't touch it and it's not, you're not bothered by it as an animator. You can just ignore the existence. 
But if you want, you can click on a Stripify button and then you can have, a, say, a walk cycle and then repeat that five times and then you have your like five times a walk cycle. And how they interact with each other, we still have to flesh out. But by making this decision of having this implicit, like this infinite strip, all the tooling in, in the Python code and the C++ code is forced to immediately from the get-go work with strips. And that means that when you're working with your animation, your tools will just keep working, no matter whether you're working in a strip or not. From Blender's point of view, you're always working in a strip, so things stay consistent. It's my very much our desire to not have an NLA editor that's another editor that's not even shown in the animation workspace by default. And just one thing that works well consistently. Then we dive even deeper, because I said, like, F-curves we're going to keep. And F curves are like they are in the current action, but we want to be able to add different channel types as well. Currently, grease pencil data, like the animation data of grease pencil, it is still contained within the grease pencil data block. That is just a flat list of all the drawings you ever made, and it's numbered one, two, three, four, five. And the animation data is nothing else than on frame 15, show drawing number five. On frame 20, show drawing number 37. We want to move that into the actual animation system. Again, so that all the tooling that we build for this can work consistently with different kinds of animation data. And then finally, the ID chooser is basically a generalization of the um, camera markers. Camera markers are useful. They set the scene camera to some other camera. Basically, for that particular property, they choose First that thing, and then that thing, and then that thing. And I believe we can make that more generic so that you can use the same approach for other things instead of having these very specific markers for this one goal. So that's a lot. And so we had to plan a little bit. And you can see the further it goes into the future, the fuzzier it gets. <laughs> so what we're working on now is a minimal data model. No UI, no workflow just being able to have an animation data block, have layers, have strips, have keys in there, be able to save them to a blend file and read them from the blend file again and have them evaluated. So that is where we are now. Then early next year, minimal working user interface so you can actually animate with the things. Then we're going back to the data model because I'm sure that by having a user interface and like people actually using it will find all kinds of missing things and we know we're missing things because it's a minimal data model, and not the full data model. And again, work on UI. Then early, like end of 2004, 24-ish uh, stabilization, and then porting the last bits and pieces and deprecating the old system. And then we hope to have like at least half a year where we can do other stuff before Blender 5.0 comes out. And while this is going on, we also have plans, but this is not in the slides, about when it's going to integrate with Blender. So right now it's on a separate branch. You can download a build on a special place if you know what to look for. Um, that's in that branch. Next step will be that it's merged into the main version of Blender behind an experimental flag. You go to the you download an alpha build, you enable it in the experimental stuff, you can play with it. And gradually, we will make it more and more accessible for mainstream Blender. But that way, at least we put it in people's hands and we can get feedback without breaking people's existing animation workflows. So now let's take a look. This is the UI that we have now. And this is just to show that it, it's there. And I don't have to write Python code all the time to see if I'm doing the right thing. So Suzanne is now the active object. It has an animation data block. It has an output selected. We have one layer, named the one layer. It has the infinite strip that you otherwise wouldn't see. So let's look at the current user interface for this. That's Python. So I very quickly go through this. We have now two objects, Cube and Suzanne. We create the animation data block, and we call it anim. Then we create an output for the cube, we create an output for Suzanne. We assign the animation data block to the cube and Suzanne. 
Then we'll create a layer. That's the, the one layer. You can see we don't create a strip because it's already there because this layer always has that infinite strip. And then you can tell the strip, just insert a key for that output, location, to, so that's a Z axis, time, uh, sorry, value and time. And then you go all Python on Suzanne and you do more animation. And this is what it looked like. What you can see me do is I toggle the output of um, Suzanne. Let me play it again. I toggle the output of Suzanne between one and two. Uh, one is actually the cube's output. And so it moves with the cube. It gets the same animation. And two is Suzanne's output. Of course, in the user interface, you're going to see a nice string. You're going to see that it's Suzanne's and cubes and etc. But for now, it works. And you can also add another layer with another strip, and then you can add another rotation over another axis. And the evaluation is really stupid, so I chose different axes of animation because otherwise it just overrides. But this is in the branch now, and it, it works. I must say this was really a magical moment when like, we put everything together, we press space, and you see stuff moving in the 3D viewport. It's fantastic. <laughs> but Later, to animate, you need to be able to set keys, which is a segue to Crystal. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, apart from this new awesome animation data block, we are also working on overhauling the, the keying system. So I'm sure there is a lot of animators, and they know that if you just go to the viewport and press I, you get this nice UI, which has a lot of confusing options, and you Half of them, people don't know what they do. Um, so we just want to get rid of this and it should be as easy as just press I and you get the keyframes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way this works is this is now moved to the user preferences. There are no options for you to define, hey, you do you want to key location, rotation, scale, rotation mode, custom properties. And you set it once and it's there. Keying sets won't go away though. Um, we are working on improving them as well. So I'm not sure how many of you know, but there are custom keying sets in Blender. Um, if you use them, talk to me afterwards because I'd like to know why you use them. <laughs> um, because currently they're very limited because they're, they're bound to an ID. So you need to specify an object and then from that object you specify, for example, location and a single custom property. And if you then want to animate a different cube, you need to make a new keying set because the first keying set points to this other cube. And we just want to make custom keying sets relative. So you just specify, hey, I want to key location X and this other channel. And it just works on based on your selection. The, the use case for this is um, camera animation, for example, because you specify location, rotation, and like focal length. And then you have this keying set and you can animate all different cameras and you just press I and you always key the focal length. Um, apart from that, we'll also improve auto keying. So currently auto keying has a lot of options that partially contradict um, and we will simplify it, streamline it and just make it a bit more predictable. Um, so that was the section of what we are currently working on and now is the section of kind of the aspirational near future. Uh, well, we shouldn't call it near future, like slightly further away future. It's distant future. Well, it's not, it's not too distant. <laughs> um, so we want to have uh, ghosting in Blender. Um, what you can see here is a prototype by Falk. He's a Christmas developer. Um, and the reason why he did it is because we want to have a common ghosting system between grease pencil and other objects. Um, however, as you can imagine, this has a lot of technical hurdles to, to overcome, um, most notably performance. Um, so the, 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 the goal is that your current frame never ever slows down, so the other ghosts need to like compute asynchronously or whatever. Uh, yeah, so it's a fancy feature, needs a bit of uh, solid technical foundation first before we can actually ship it. Um, 
And there is another thing for Nathan. Are you sure that booing wouldn't be more appropriate? <laughs> no, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not. Oh, thank you. Finally, someone understands. Uh, yeah, so something else that we're looking into is selection sets and bone pickers, and I'll get a little bit more into this as we go, but it's not limited to these, but it's more talking about how can we handle this. So rigs and also scenes generally can be very complex and difficult to manage, and we want to allow animators to kind of uh, wrangle that complexity uh, and get better workflows out of it. So there are some things, particularly for rigs, that we already have, like rig layers can help to manage this complexity. You can turn rig layers off that you aren't using. Uh, but the thing about rig layers is that they are, you know, they come with the rig, they're static, they're determined by the rigger, uh, and they're per rig, not per shot in general. Uh, and just in general, anything that comes with the rig is not tailored to the specific animator or the specific shot that they're working on. The other thing is that Wrangling this kind of complexity isn't just about organization, it's also a, a workflow problem. So we want animators to be able to quickly scope down what they're working with based on what they're focused on at the moment. We want them to be able to quickly and accurately select things uh, and be confident that what they're keyframing are the things that they intend to be keyframing. And you know, the list goes on. So selection sets are something we already have an add-on for, and they're just a simple animator-centric organization of rig controls. And you can quickly select one of those sets from a pop-up in the menu, and then pose uh, using those, or you can hide everything else. Uh, and then you can select that again to do your keying. Uh, and you can also add your own. And so one of the things that's great about selection sets is that it is the animator's set of controls, the animator's organization for how they want to be working. Uh, and also, one of the really cool features of this add-on is that you can take them with you. So you can actually copy and paste these selection sets into other scenes and onto other characters. So uh, the animator's personal set is something that is, you know, can be part of their general workflow that they take with them. But you can also do it on a per-shot basis. So the next thing is bone pickers. So how many of you are familiar with this sort of thing? Yeah, it's in so many other pieces of software, uh, and it's you know it's really handy, particularly for uh, cases where the 3D viewport could get really confusing, or it could the controls could obscure what you're working on. Faces are a really good example of this, where you're trying to get the right facial expression, but all of those lines of the rig controls actually make it hard to see what that expression is. Um, so it really declutters the viewport and makes it easier for you to see what you're doing. Uh, and it's also really good for controls that maybe don't make sense to be floating around in 3D space. So there's a lot of rigs that have their kind of settings bone that you select uh, to manipulate the settings of the rig. And there's not, it, it's kind of weird for that to be floating around in 3D space. It'd be nice if there's a, a specific place you could go to for that. Uh, the other thing is that bone pickers can be organized, the, the selection uh, widgets can be organized for fast selection rather than to be uh, proportionate to the character. So in this example, and this is something that Rick, where is Rick? Hi. Yeah, Rick pointed out, uh, is like, yeah, when you have hands, uh, if you're trying to work in the 3D viewport and select, say, all the fingertips, it's, it's painful. It's, you have to basically click on every one of them. But if you have a bone picker where they're all aligned in a row, you can just box select them really quick. And you can also box select a whole finger really quick or, you know, whatever. So this is uh, really, really useful for just quick and accurate selection in certain circumstances as well. Uh, and it, additionally, it doesn't have to be limited to selection. So something we've been talking about is being able to actually have buttons in there that you can click that will actually run operators or scripts. Um, and we can maybe expand that out into even more stuff in the future. Uh, but this is all aspirational. We haven't actually been working on this yet. Uh, but the goal is for it to be something that animators themselves can easily build. So you could have them come with the rig, probably a lot of them would, but also the, these would also be something that the animator could actually create for themselves and customize to themselves on a per character or per shot basis. But, uh, so yeah, I've talked about kind of these two different ways of tackling uh, complexity and they each tackle different aspects of complexity. 
uh, but they're also kind of disjoint from each other. And we want solutions that are complementary and work well together. So how are we going to bring all of this together? Uh, well, this is for the future, so we're still working on it. But our goal is to, to go further than just these two things and really figure out uh, some powerful ways for animators to tame the complexity of their shots and focus their workflow. So there's also even more things getting away from all that stuff uh, in the further, further future. And these are things that we've had a lot of discussions about we really want to do, uh, but are not on the current uh, roadmap. Uh, one of them is rig nodes. So Sebrin here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we've been doing over the last year, we have been implementing a lot of concrete actual features, but we've also been doing explorations and just trying out different ideas. Uh, and this is a prototype that Sebron put together for a possible future rigging node system. This is in Python right now. Uh, Sebron himself will tell you about the horrible hacks that are underneath it to make it work. Uh, but it is really fun to play with, but it's definitely not production ready. Uh, but yeah, so the, the idea is to be able to do your rigging with nodes. And one of the things that this will enable is uh, getting around dependency cycles. Uh, where, you, like in the dependency graph, uh, if you get those dependency cycles, your things don't update. Uh, in, in some sense, you can kind of build your own dependency graph uh, with these limited to within the rig, so you can do some really powerful stuff. Uh, some other things uh, that we... Uh, have been exploring is uh, custom bone axes. So right now, the long axis of all bones is Y, which is a little weird since in Blender, Z is up. Like, Z is kind of the special axis in Blender. Uh, and this causes a bunch of issues. Uh, I won't go into the de details, but we'd like to be able to allow people to customize that uh, so they can select which axis is the long axis. Uh, animation snippets in the pose library. So not just individual poses, but you could actually, for example, drag in an entire animation snippet onto uh, the animation editor, for example, uh, and tweak that. Uh, and uh, more <laughs> rest poses. So uh, currently, armatures have a single rest pose, but you might want more than one. And a good example of this is you might have a character modeled like this, so you want to set up the rig that way for deformations, for the binding, for bind posing, the, for the bind pose. Uh, but for animation, you might want it to be like this. You might want this to be the rest pose for animation. So uh, there's, I think, even more applications than just that case, but that is one concrete use case where multiple rest poses would be really useful, so we want to explore that as well. And there's just a whole bunch more things that we've been exploring, so there's just a, a smattering of examples, but. Yeah, uh, we want to, the, although the, the current targets for 2025 are the new data model and the, the animation layers and all that stuff and the UI to go along with it, uh, that's the foundations that we're building. Because after we finish that, we want to go even further and really, really uh, build on top of it a set of features that work really well together to make animation a much faster process and a much more joyful one. So. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, bye. <laughs> oh, yeah, does anyone have uh, questions? Yeah. using Unity game engine, but at work we're now using Unreal and coming from 
Maya, we are able to preserve the uh, parent scale matrix, and the animations come out perfectly with Splash and Sketch on non-weak bone. And I'm wondering if that's something that's been thought about in when you're baking the pipelines that are that are coming here, because that's going to be something that you know, if our character is breathing, their chest <coughs> needs to be able to scale non-uniformly, and everything else is going to have to not be messed up uh, from that bake. Yeah, that super, super makes sense. Uh, I don't know if we, we've thought about it specifically in the context of baking, but I think that would actually be even easier to address than uh, what we have been considering, which is even just bringing the concept of uh, a full transform matrix uh, to the bones and objects directly. Uh, so you would actually be able to work with those in the context of uh, just kind of what they are in the viewport. Like, it wouldn't just be limited to location, scale, and rotation. You could actually have a shear matrix, for example. Um, but yeah, I, th I mean, just the baking part of it, I think, is even, like, or exports part of it is probably something we could even do right now, I think. I'd have to think about it, but uh, it yeah, I, certainly something that uh, we can do. And uh, now that you mention it, I think is important to address. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. So I, I'm not 100% sure if I followed everything that you said, but one of the, one of the aspects that I, I think I caught on, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is you're linking a bunch of different things into a scene to do game animations. Uh, and I have my animations stored in other files, so I can make a super big file. And I okay. Them, and I Got them it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, maybe you can speak more to this. Uh, one of the... Uh, things in the pose library is pretty much this. Like the, one of the issues is that it's hard to update a pose because Blender is not allowed to write to other blend files. Like you're only like you're editing the current blend file. And if you go to write to other blend files, you open up like a whole heap of complex issues that like you can't undo for just to name one. But what we did add was just right click on any asset, open in Blender, and it will just open another Blender for you uh, because it knows which file it's stored in. It just opens another Blender. You can edit it. You close the Blender. The first Blender you were in is still open, and it was monitoring that second Blender. So as soon as it sees it quitting, it will refresh the asset browser, and you see your new asset there. So I think this kind of workflow could work well in combination with the asset browser, uh, in combination with the uh, linking that is supported in there, and the uh, I have hope for the new animation data block that it will also make these kind of things easier because you just need less different actions and less things to, to juggle. Uh, this is currently more or less possible, like at least the right click open in Blender, but maybe we just have to talk. Maybe you join an animation meeting sometimes because this is very much, uh, it sounds like a very specific thing for which we might be able to think up something generic that is useful for everybody. And, Practical input is always welcome. I was uh, I was going to say one one more thing. Uh, so one of the one of the motivating use, motivating use cases for allowing more than one object's animation to be specified in a single animation data block is actually the game animation case because you often have a character that will have a prop and then a different pop prop in a different animation, and it's obnoxious to have like three different actions specifying the same what's conceptually the same animation that you want to be exported as one thing. Uh, so that, I think, is maybe one aspect of what you were talking about, but I think Seaburn probably hit it more on the nail. <laughs> <laughs> I have them associated with the objects itself as well, because they are 
earlier you stated as long as they are in the active action of the object or they are in the MLA. Right. Yeah. 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 That, and that also goes back to post library and bigger tooling, uh, because when you rename a bone, it doesn't update the post library. Just to name another pain point. I saw a finger there. Yeah. So if we have ghosting, we need to have animation caching. Just saying. <laughs> and also, like as a more general thing, we want to avoid caching because caching is very, very simple. Knowing when your cache is no longer valid is very hard. So I'd rather have somebody working on like a faster system altogether. And then hopefully we don't need as much caching. But yeah. Yes, like the, um, I'm super interested in like the, the ringing notes and where that might lead to. Like, um, I'm a tech artist in games and I uh, do a lot of Maya stuff, obviously. And like the things that I love about the Maya note graph is that you, you have access to basically all the stuff in there. Like I, I tap transform values to a blend color node because that's like a simple three channel uh, blend uh, operator and stuff like that. So like with the ringing node system, like our, is the idea to do it like as a, as a purely ring animation basis, or would it try to integrate more with other aspects of Blender, so you could like have transforms from other objects and use uh, different kind of features? So currently, the rig node system is like a, as Nathan said, really hacky, and we want to keep going in that way for now, just to create a workflow that, even though the implementation is rubbish, gives us a good idea of the things we want to do with these rig nodes and what should be possible with it. And only once we have a better view of that, we start looking at, okay, how do we implement this like for real? Is it going to be a separate node system? Is it going to be part of geometry nodes? That feels very tempting, but like jumping too quickly onto geometry nodes, I think will give us certain blind spots that we still want to keep an eye on. Yeah. Um, but I hope to be like, I, I, I hope this will be possible. Um, we have time for one question too. Oh yeah, no, this is just for the post library and it's just as, as stupidly simple as you think it is. So it will just open another blender, which will use its own memory. And if you have very big objects in both, it may not be enough. That. <laughs> Last one. Yes. Okay, last one. For the nodes you were talking about for animation, can you just tell me about some of the nodes you had prototyped? Because I didn't really get to see the site too well, so it wasn't like a teaser. You mean this this hack? Yeah. Um, okay, so very quickly, people who are familiar with Unreal Control Rig will, will know how this works. So we have two starting points. And the bottom one is called the forward solve, which runs when you move a control, it runs the forward solve. It has nodes to get the transforms of controls. It has nodes to set transforms of bones. And this basically gives you like control over bones. And then there is the beauty uh, in there that has the two bluish inputs and the purple one. And that is the two bone IK. This is my pride and joy. Um, to evaluate, it receives like it has two get controls, so it receives two transforms, one for the target, one for the pole vector. It creates two new empties in the scene with those transforms. Then on the bone, it adds an IK constraint and plugs the empties in there. It evaluates it. It copies the resulting transforms. It deletes the empties and the constraint again, <laughs> pastes the transforms onto the bones. And that is one evaluation cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's rubbish, but it works. And the cool thing is that that rig there 
Um, I can later show it on my laptop working, but like live demo thing. Uh, that rig is just forward IK, it's stupidly simple bones, it has nothing. And, oh sorry, I forgot the, the upper bit. The upper bit is the backward solve, and that has um, get bone transform and set control transform. So it can put the controls back onto the bones. And this means that like, currently one runs in object mode, the other runs in pose mode. So in pose mode, you can grab a bone and rotate it, FK style, and your IK control will just follow suit. And then you click on the control, Blender automatically switches to object mode. You move the control and you have your IK control. And that just works. And then that, when it gets really glitchy, um, because Blender's like drawing stuff is not made for this, uh, but where's my mouse? That is also an empty that acts as a control. And scaling that will scale the bone, which still runs the IK, so the tip of the bone stays at the same point. But the joint that that control is on will move around because like the, the, the upper arm is scaling all the time. And then that node graph will just put it back on that joint. So you got the transform of the control influencing the bone, influencing the con transform of the control, which would traditionally be like a, a dependency cycle that Blender can't handle. But with this, it's just nodes executed in order, so it's fine. Yeah, and that's it. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>